The following podcast was recorded on Monday, September 25th, 2023, featuring Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at biancoresearch.com or arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest edition of Talking Data. I'm your host, Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by our commentator, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Hello, Jim. Hello. Today, Jim will provide a historical perspective on our star. Jim, to start us off, what is our star and what is the significance today? So our star is a fancy term that the Fed uses. It was the, the most of the work on it has been done by New York Federal Reserve President John Williams. And it's the neutral funds rate. It's the rate at which you set the funds rate so it doesn't stimulate or restrict the economy. Now, the way they measure that is they measure it on a real basis, meaning um, relative to inflation or after inflation. And the Fed has talked about our star as being somewhere at around 50 basis points or half a percent. In other words, whatever you think the long run inflation rate is, if our star is half a percent above that, so if you think the long run inflation rate is 2%, which is what the Fed still thinks it is, I don't. And I've argued this many times over the years that I think we're in a higher inflation environment. But if you think it's 2%, then the neutral funds rate is 250. So that's you know the significance of our star. So if we go to the first chart, why is that chart number significant? Because as we'll dive into this a little bit later, <clears throat> there's a belief that the Fed is going to start cutting rates somewhere in the future. Now, we've been thinking this for well over a year, and the Fed keeps raising rates because our star is well above, you know, the neutral funds rate is well above that 2% rate uh, that the Fed thinks. In other words, the Fed thinks the long-run inflation rate is 2. They still think that. The current funds rate is 5 and a quarter to 5 and a half. Well, that's 300 basis points above the neutral rate. This is why that blue line that you see, which is what the Fed has been communicating, and that red line on this chart, which is what the forward markets have been pricing, always go down because that big interest rate is well above that 50 basis point R star. And so, therefore, the Fed is too tight. They're going to, once they realize that inflation has been vanquished, they're going to start bringing rates down. Now, I will remind you, we've been saying this for the last 15 rate hikes. So it's been wrong for a long time right now, at least as far as an argument for cutting rates. Now, I guess if you keep saying it until the end of time, it'll eventually be right. But it has been completely wrong for a long time as we move forward. So that's what our star is. And that's what the significance of our star is in the current environment is is it's projecting interest rate cuts. Where is the proper level of our star? So that's a very good question. And this is a debate. And no less than uh, Chairman Powell talked about this last week in his press conference. And he said the correct answer. Our, and I'll, I'll paraphrase what he said. Our star is an academic argument as to what that level should be. It is not a Bloomberg symbol you can go look up. We're guessing as to what our star is. We believe it's half a percent above the long run inflation rate. Now, there's two problems with that. We don't really know what the long run inflation rate is. We can guess at that too. And we don't know if we even knew what the long run inflation rate is. We don't know what, where interest rates should be relative to that long run inflation rate. So I'll leave the inflation rate argument for another podcast. I've done previous ones about inflation in the past. And I'll focus on the level of our star. So if we go to the next chart, um, the Fed has been arguing that it's 50 basis points versus John Williams' work and some work bond done by the IMF. Now, if you look at this chart, this is tips yields. Now, for the uninitiated, 
there is a, a security tips, treasury inflation protected securities. When you buy these things, whatever the inflation rate is, is you get that in terms of extra bonds or what they refer to as accretion. Sounds like you should go to the doctor for that, but they call it accretion. So if the inflation rate is 4%, they give you 4% more bonds because of that's what the inflation rate is. And then this yield is what you get on top of that, otherwise a real yield, yield above the inflation rate. And you can see here is the chart going back to the end of the financial crisis in, as it says in the top, June of 2009. The line on the chart is the average. It's been 32 basis points and it's been between 100 basis points and minus 42. But that 32 basis points is very close to that 50 basis points that John Williams has been arguing. The IMF, who did a paper about this in April, just basically said it. Once the inflation rate has been vanquished, we're gonna go right back to where we were since the post-financial crisis 2009, which is close enough to 50 basis, 32 basis points, close enough to 50 basis points for government work, and that that's what our star is. Now, they're making an assumption here that that's like the normal rate of where real rates should be. So we go to the next chart, the same chart, except I went all the way back to 1999 now. I didn't end it in 2009. I added the previous 10 years before, and I only went back to 99 because that's when we started trading tips. Now the average is 132 basis points. It's not 32 basis points. It added an extra 100 basis points to it, with a much wider standard deviation. But still, that just captures one cycle. We don't have treasury inflation protected securities uh, going back pre-99, at least in the United States, we don't. They did trade in UK back into the early 80s, but we're not talking about the UK here today. So what would it have been if we had longer history? Well, this blue line that you're looking at here is the tips market. So if we jump to the next chart, the next chart here, the blue line is the same thing that I just showed you before. That's the tips yield. The black line is what I'll call the actual um, uh, real rate. That's you take the yield of the 10 year, which is 453 the day we're recording, minus whatever the actual inflation rate is, the year over year change in CPI, which is 3.7. And that's how you wind up getting your uh, real yield. Well, this, you could see the blue line and the black line, they fit reasonably well on each other going back to 1999. There's some spikes and dips in there a little bit, but they fit reasonably well. So I took this all the way back to 1962. Now the real yield average is 2%. It's no longer 32 basis points or 1.32 basis points. It's 2%. So we go to the final chart. Remember this black line was the real yield going back to 62. There it is on that chart. This chart takes various measures of interest rates and inflation back to 1800. I'm kind of, you know, going to the extreme to get my point across. The real yield there is 4.32% on average for the last 225 or so years. Uh, so real yields vary all over the place. And uh, depending on what regime you're in and where you are in the cycle, and so for the Fed to say, no, 2009 to 2019, that's, that's it. Put it in a textbook. Let everybody for the next 100 years learn this is how real yields trade. And that's the way that we're going we're gonna to wind up trading them. That is a mistake, I think, that could wind up really becoming a big problem. Famously, if you look at this chart closely, from 1953 to 1969, the real yield averaged 3%. And in the early 1970s, we had a slew of papers come out, real yields are 3%. They will always be 3% now and forever. And you could put it in a textbook and teach everybody that for the last 100 years. And right when they wrote all those papers, it stopped being that way for the next 50 years. Well, now we're making that same mistake again. We're now saying real yields are 50 basis points. They never change. It doesn't matter to the environment. And you can put it in a textbook and teach everybody this. And that's where we're, where we're at with at least real yield. So history shows this thing is all over the place. Jim, does our star change over time? Yes, it does change over time. Let's go to the last chart. Uh, the last chart is 
the red line on this chart, that is um, the 10-year yield going back to the end of World War II. It's just the 10-year yield on the right scale in red. The blue line is the S&P on a log scale, just stock prices, bond yields. The bottom chart shows the correlation between stocks and bonds. The shaded area, as it says in the bottom of the chart, is whenever the five-year correlation is above zero. That was from 1968 to 2001. All the non-shaded areas are when it was below zero. So the first thing I want to point out about this chart is the stock bond relationship is not stable. It changes over time. In other words, R star changes over time. It does not stay stationary as what we're assuming here. We're going to go back to the way we were in 2019. If anybody's been listening to this podcast, you know, I say that all the time about remote work and about the cycle. Well, here we are saying it about uh, real rates as well. We're going to go back there. What causes the relationship between stocks and bonds and real rates to change over time? Perceptions of inflation. From 1968 to 01, the dominant thing in the bond market was inflation. Now, from 68 to 80, it was worries about higher inflation, and that's why stock prices went down and bond prices went down. They were positively correlated. From 80 to 2000, it was disinflation. Hey, I'm worried about inflation, but it's going away. So stock prices went up, bond prices went up. 2001, the word deflation became kind of the word that we've been using. And in, uh, in a deflationary environment, when we were worried about deflation, bonds would go up in price or yields fall and stocks would go down because stocks don't like deflation. When we were relieved, there was no deflation. Stocks would go up, good, no deflation. Deflation means losses, no earnings, it's terrible for stocks. So when you were leave, there is no deflation, stocks go up, but bonds sell off. And we so institutionalized that this is the 60-40 portfolio, which is the basis for a lot of wealth management strategies for people with their money, because stocks and bonds move opposite each other. But if you look at the light green line, which is the three-year correlation, it shot up to the highest level in 20 plus years. This relationship is reverting back to more like that 68 to 01 period. Why? Because inflation is becoming more and more of a concern in the marketplace right now. It is not going away. It is not, the market, at least in my mind, is not arguing we're going to return to 2% inflation. If the inflation rate is a concern, and remember, when I say it's a concern, you could say it's the top concern, but good news, it's not a problem. So we could have a rally, but it is the concern. If that is the case, then real yields will run much higher than 50 basis points. That what the Fed is doing is they're taking an outlier period of 2000 and the IMF too, the 2009 to 2019, and they're saying that was normal. No, that was an outlier is what that was. And that maybe... In real rates closer to 2%, maybe even higher, are kind of the normal. Now, what does that mean? Well, if the inflation rate, the long-run inflation rate is closer to 3 which is what I think it's been, and I've been arguing this forever, um, then if we're in an inflationary environment, then real yields are closer to 2 That means 5% is neutral on the funds rate, not 3 in other words, the funds rate is just somewhat restrictive right now, or a little bit restrictive. This, in my mind, explains why what everybody's been scratching their head about. We've had this gigantic rise in interest rates and this inverted yield curve, and rates rise till something breaks. And we thought it was the banking system, but then the banking system really didn't break. It just kind of was a storm that passed. So we keep we're saying we're going to have a recession in the quarter after the next one because of these, these burdensomely high interest rates. And it never happens. Why? Because maybe because all interest rates have done is followed neutral higher and that they haven't really gotten restrictive yet. And the basis for me to say this is if we are in an inflationary environment, and I'm talking about three as the long run inflation rate is I like to joke, not 8%, 10% or Zimbabwe long run inflation rate. I don't need it to go to some ridiculous number like that. Oh, yeah, cyclically, it could, it could spike up to those kind of numbers. But then just like last year, it won't last, it'll come down. But the average stays at around three. Then if we're in this inflationary environment, 
then the R star is probably closer to two, which means we're not that restrictive. We're, we're restrictive. We're above five, but we're not nearly as restrictive, which explains why this big rise in interest rates, stocks have rallied, the economy continues to churn out positive GDP quarters, which has got the moniker of no landing, meaning that we're not going to have the economy come down to near zero in a soft landing or below it in a hard landing. It just continues to fly along at some positive number to continue with the airplane metaphor. And so really the, the message I wanna leave you with here is, are we in an inflationary environment? Because I believe we are. And I believe we're in a more like a 3% inflation world, not two. Yeah, that's a big difference. Because what that means is the Fed's just a little bit above neutral is what that means right now. This is why the economy doesn't crater in the face of higher rates. This is why, other than that summer storm of the banking system, we don't see things breaking left and right all over the place. And this is why the argument that you hear all the time, I heard somebody on Bloomberg TV today say, just raise rates in November, so then we could get past this and we could talk about next year's cuts. That's exactly the way he said it. I was like, yeah, because you're assuming 50 basis points above 2%, two and a half is the neutral funds rate. If we're five and a half, then the Fed's way, way too restrictive. And that's why they think we're going to have rate cuts. Now, like I said, they've been wrong for the last 16 rate hikes by making that argument. And if you keep making it forever, eventually it'll look like it's right. But the assumption there is 2% is the inflation rate. We have no inflation problem. We're still in the pre-COVID relationship of a 50 basis point R star. All of those assumptions, I think, are questionable right now. And if you start to understand that they're questionable, you could see why rates have gone up so much. You could see why the economy is performing so well in the face of these higher rates, because we're still just barely above neutral, why the stock market doesn't have a problem with it either. And I think that the interest rate scenario starts to make a little more sense. But the problem is that people are still locked into 20, uh, 2010 to 2020, that's normal for all of time. 2% inflation, zero on the funds rate and everything. We're going to go back to that and stay there for 100 years. That was the outlier period. And I think that period ended with COVID. And to look for it to return, I think, is misplaced. Jim, thank you for your thoughts today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. If you have any questions on Arbor Research, Bianca Research, or Arbor Data Science, you can contact us by emailing Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Have a great day, everyone.